So there was one guy who went in and he came out and he was like moved by the three minute meeting. And Robert Berkowitz has a timer and it rings and then the next guy just pulls you out. So this guy, he said he came in and he, he asked Robert Berkowitz, he said, Rebbe, what should I do? My wife is very lazy. That was his question. So what's that like three seconds? He said, Robert Berkowitz sat there and he said, she's, she's lazy. Mm-hmm. She's lazy. So you summed up your wife <laughs> as lazy. That's everything about her is lazy. She's just lazy. And he said for like two minutes and like 50 seconds. <laughs> that was all Robert Berkowitz kept repeating. So she's lazy. That's, that's, that's the way you view her. You view her whole essence, all of her goodness, all of her everything is just lazy. And then like the last three seconds before the clock expired, he said, she's not just lazy. <laughs> and then beep, 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 and he got pulled out of the room. And he came out and he was like, well, he just changed my whole perspective on my wife. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And the secret is out. When it comes to Orthodox Judaism, there is a code that us Orthodox Jews have to help cultivate and maintain a happy marriage. It is by far one of the most beautiful things about Orthodox Judaism. And in this episode, I went to Tom's River to speak to Rabbi Ruvain and Gitti Epstein, who are both married, who are a chassan teacher and a kala teacher. You'll hear more about that. And their advice on maintaining and having and cultivating, even if you're single, how to have a happy marriage. I know it sounds too good to be true, but in the end of this episode, I will personally share why I think that what we discuss, it's one of the most powerful things in Orthodox Judaism. This episode is in memory of Shem David ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. In this episode, you will hear about our friends at Pick Purple and how you could get rid of your clothing and help out people in need and girls in need. You'll hear about that. You'll also hear about Twillery, the clothing brand. I'm wearing their pants right now. And you will hear about why their clothing is so incredible and how it could be the last clothing brand that you actually need. And you could use our code word for money off. You'll hear about the incredible software at Bitbean and how when I say the word software, you might be thinking, how could that actually help my business? Well, it can. And speaking about helping businesses, you could get your next employee from overseas at Hiring for Less. And you're going to hear so much more about them. And you're going to hear the keys to a successful marriage right now with Rabbi Ruvain and Getty. Here's a conversation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, welcome to your home. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, joking aside, thanks for opening it up for me. And I want to jump right into it. Um, each of you do incredible work for either chassans or kalas or couples and and more. Like we'll get it to the counting, the juicy stuff. <laughs> but uh, first, tell me about your personal life, uh, maybe how you met, how you were set up, and how you got into this space. Sure. Okay. So we dated on a Monday, a Thursday, and got engaged on a Sunday. We did it three times. And I never recommend that anybody try that. <laughs> but for us, um, it sort of worked in a very interesting way. When we dated, you know, I went out with my wife and I, I saw how, as a person, she was totally different than I was. Totally different. Um, I got lost on the date. And you got to know me a little bit. You see like my personality <laughs> being a certain rigidness, a certain, you know, I don't call it OCD, but like a certain cross the T's, dot the I's. It's just like how You're an brain. accountant. I'm an accountant. I always say like accountants are, we're born, we're not trained. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a brain. It's a certain brain. So, we, you know, we were driving and I had printed out maps because it was the days before smartphones and all that. Um, and I got lost and I turned to my wife in like in a bit of a panic. Um, and I was like, uh, I, 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 I don't, I don't know where we are. And she's like, eh, it's fine. It's great. You know, it's like sitting back and I'm with you. It's no problem. Wherever we end up, it'll be amazing. And I was like, whoa. And it, it was a realization that a part of marriage is really the idea of a person working on themselves and balancing themselves. So when I saw somebody who would balance me, it was just like, whoa, this is incredible. So we dated three times and we got engaged three months later. And we moved to Israel for. I'm married. I'm sorry, we got married five years later. <laughs> <laughs> we got engaged. <laughs> we got engaged on our third date. We were engaged for three months. We got married 
three months later, and uh, we moved to Israel for five years. And in Israel, we started studying the ideas behind marriage. We were very fortunate to learn in Rabbi Berkowitz's call and Eretz Yisrael. And we got very close to Rabbi Califan, who is a marriage expert. And we just started studying marriage just to understand it for ourselves. We knew that we, you know, were coming into this fresh and new, and we really wanted to like digest these ideas and unpack them. So we would just sit and learn and study, sit up late at night. Some Friday night meals would go till the wee hours of the morning, just like unpacking different concepts. And um, the rest is history, as they say. That was like how we got into this world of like marriage education. I'm like understanding what it is and then giving it over and sitting with couples who want to understand how to like do marriage in the highest you know level possible. I have so many questions, but it's so interesting that you know typically if you want to drive a car, you go ahead and take a bunch of tests and driving tests and people fail and they finally pass. But when it comes to marriage or having children, it's like, yeah, just go ahead, have fun, go do it. <laughs> and and maybe that's why so many people in the world statistically get divorced. You don't really find so many people investing their time and energy into figuring out what makes a good marriage like you guys did. Right. I mean, for me, again, I think a lot of it comes down to my personality. I'm, I'm very much into the idea that everything in life is systems. So there's the ecosystem, right? And there's the economy, financial system. Your body is a system. Everything is a system. So when I talk to my gardener, he talks to me about how there's like 78 types of grass, <laughs> right? He studies that system because that's his profession. So if a person gets married, I think it's incumbent, you know, upon us to really like delve into what does it mean to be married? What does it mean to be a parent? And you're right. A lot of people, they just wing it and they're just like, I don't know, I'll figure it out. And I think even a lot of um, chassan classes or kala classes is a lot about these generalized ideas of like, just be happy and just be peaceful and just give in all the time or communication is the best, you know, thing for marriage. And to me, that didn't speak to me. It was like, okay, yeah, those are very nice ideas, of course, from a 30,000 foot view, but what is the system? Like, let's unpack the system and let's understand why is it that many people are not happy and fulfilled in their marriage? Forget divorce. Divorce is, of course, you know, hopefully the worst, you know, but even people in marriages, they're just looking at each other going like, eh, we could have done better or I could have done better, you know, or whatever that that feeling of loneliness or abandonment or or resentment, like all those feelings that build up, it's usually coming because you haven't really properly studied the system. And just like your grass doesn't grow if you don't understand how to water it and give it sunlight and all the things that it needs, a marriage also doesn't grow if you don't put in the elements that are needed for it to grow. So when a chassan or kala come to either of you and you're trying to help them and I guess give them a super crash course on like how to live a happy marriage, yeah. what's your main intention when they sit down with you? So it's definitely a crash course because it's only between seven to 10 classes that you're sitting with someone and giving them as much information that you could give. It's not only on how to have a good marriage. It's also all the halacha and all the laws that pertain to all, you know, marriage, help us need and all of that tars mishpacha that we teach. So it's really a very small window. But I always tell my girls, this is just the beginning of your marriage education. What I could give you is just this. But then you have me. So whenever you have any questions, you could reach out. I always have my time slots when I could talk to them. I give them additional reading materials and different podcasts to listen to and things like that in order for them to develop. I really believe that most of marriage development is your own personal development. Mm. And especially when Kyle has asked me, give me marriage books before I get married. I say, before you get the marriage books, I want you to read the self-development books. I want you to work on yourself, understanding why you're doing things, understanding your emotions, understanding yourself so that you could understand another person. So yeah, it's a crash course for sure, but um, it's a link to so much more. It, yeah, I was just going to add that it's true. The idea that we we try to give the couples, like my last thing I say to every chassan is this is not the end. This is just the beginning. And it's the beginning of his marriage and it's the beginning of our relationship with them. So we've taught hundreds of people, besides people that we counsel, but people who we've we've taught from A to Z in terms of like, here's how to be married and now they're getting married in a couple of days. And then those relationships, which are now some of them over a decade old, it's beautiful to watch those couples grow and grow and grow and be there alongside them and answer their questions. And it's true. I mean, being being there for people, I think, is really the more important than the, the the limited time that we have with them before they get married in the middle of all their appointments and preparing for marriage. So, yeah, that's one a, of my very favorite good things to do besides for teaching kalas, which I, it really is one of my favorite things to do. 
um, is to give refresher courses, which mm-hmm. means I come into a group of women, we meet, let's say five times, you know, once a week. And besides for refreshing the halacha, which a lot of people need to refresh, they forget this and that, what you're learning in a short time frame, right. Mary, there's so much that's going on, right. um, to review that, but also to get that boost in your marriage. You can be married 10, 15, 20 years, and you go home with a totally different perspective. It is so important to do that, and I really encourage people to do that, to find the right person and have these groups, besides for the sharing and the comfort, it's usually a bunch of friends that come together. Um, it's it's a totally different mindset. And I always start and I say, you probably heard some of these concepts before, but you probably heard it a long time ago. So now when you're sitting here, you come home, your whole mindset's gonna be totally different. I, I wanna get it. I actually wanna backtrack and talk about like the dating process. And I, I wanna talk about the book that you just came out with. But before that, and I typically, I don't think I've ever done this. We, we, we have this podcast primarily for people that are observant, but there's clearly a lot of non-Jews watching. And I think the way I'm going to make this question sound, I think it's going to help people that are Orthodox as well gain from it. How would you explain to a non-Jew the dating process in a way that they, cause I think, they're shocked when they see like a Lula and Esrig, but they're all shocked when we say like the from dating of like, yeah, I dated a few times and there's three months. They're like, you didn't date for seven years and then be together for three years and then get married and then get divorced two days later. <laughs> but like, how would you explain the orthodox dating system? Yeah, I think it's broken up into, into three parts. So part one, which I think many people in the secular world totally skip over is the research stage. So it's the idea that people sometimes have baggage. That's number one. Sometimes people don't have baggage, but there's underlying family, personality, uh, value systems, etc., which you, you sort of vet it before you even meet the person whatsoever. And if you get that out of the way and you get to a first date, it means that you've done enough research and you've said no to enough people to know specifically what you're looking for doesn't mean in a selfish way that you're just looking for, you know, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 on, on, on everything, but it means that you've understood compatibility and what works for you. Then the date itself is a very non-physical process, which is really focused on the emotional side of the relationship, making sure that you're liking the person, that this is the person that you want to go on vacation with, you want to spend the rest of your life with, and then talking through all those things. Hey, I heard this about you. Is it true? Or can you elaborate? And it's, it's the, emotional side of the relationship. And then there's the marriage, which is the physical side of things, which we always say the physical is really an expression of an emotional. So think about your children, right? You love your kid and then you give them a hug. So really that's the way we we approach it. You love your spouse and then you give them a hug. So if you look at it like that, the research, you're not blinded, the emotion, you're not blinded, and then the physical, it's a great progression into, you know, hopefully a very long-term relationship, which is the reason why it's so successful is because we're focused on the long term, right? From the get go, we're focused on will this person be a quality mother? And, you know, is he a very stable person? Does he give me the sense of security? Um, is he grounded? Is he financially secure? And not in like, is he rich and throwing around money? Like, is this person a smart person? Are they a centered person? So going through that process is a, it seems like a lengthier process before you get onto a date. But the dating itself goes, you know, hopefully much faster. Again, as a disclaimer, we dated three times. Do not try that at home. <laughs> Do not try that at home. It works for us, but, you know, typically it's probably seven to 10 dates is normal. Yeah, you'd say. I would say, yeah. Yeah, like seven to 10 dates. So, you know, in that amount of time, you should be able to figure out, like, are the pieces here? And then, just to say, I think it's, it's, it's just the first brick of the yellow brick road. So now is when the journey just starts of your own self-discovery, your own compatibility, and then working through with a person who you like enough and respect enough that you see the pieces there overall and hopefully that sort of leads to this like nice journey together it's i think i heard you say on another podcast that like you first if you can't spend time together in the living room then you how could you even get to the bedroom exactly yeah if there's no living room there's no bedroom there's totally linked yeah there's there's no hugs if you don't like the person right and and every time somebody comes in and says like hey you know we don't hug enough right The, the reason is usually because you have a living room issue you don't You don't spend enough time. Like the word intimacy is a living room word. You have an intimate relationship with a person. It's a close relationship. It's a deep relationship. It's somebody that like, I once heard somebody say, it's into me, see. I allow Mm. you to see into me and you do the same thing. There's an openness. There's a trusting. So when that is there, then it usually manifests itself in hugs. When that's not there, then it usually manifests itself in a lot of 
non house like it's a lot of closed you know re- and that's really the beauty of Paris Amish Baha because I keep bringing could, could you Kalama. explain it again Family so dirty. any from person's Family understanding dirty. yeah explain like on a basic level on what a basic level is that um, there's times when a husband and wife can be together versus there's a pause mm-hmm. and then there's a renewal with the whole process of going to the mikvah and um, uh, rejoining again mm-hmm. and besides for the fact that it just puts in this beautiful you know, space is needed between a couple. There's some people who say that sometimes like that mini time apart makes the time together so much more powerful and so much more meaningful. It gives you that pause so that the physical is off the table so that you can work on your emotional connection, going for walks, talking, not with the aids of any hugs or kisses. You know, it's you have to talk through your emotions so that by the time you come back from the mikvah, that expression of love is based on the 12, 12 plus days sometimes of the separation where you now are expressing all of that emotion with physical and it's extremely powerful. We always say that those days, I think most people learn it as Hassan and Kala's, like they learn it as off days. They're not off days. They're, They're very, very much, much on days. days. <laughs> those are the days where you're dating, you're spending time, like my wife is saying, like connecting and you know, it, what's brought down in the Gemara is al to make a woman more endearing to her husband. You're actually like increasing the love in your house. You're increasing the intimacy in your house, not in a physical way, but in a non-physical way so that when you express it physically, there's much more there. You know, I'll, I'll, I believe that age is just a number. And I've dealt with people who are, let's say, 75 years old and they're really five years old emotionally, <laughs> right? And, and they're throwing tantrums and they're getting angry and every little thing throws them off. Because they've aged, but they haven't matured. They haven't developed. They haven't gone through the process of becoming that wise person. They like lost out all of life's opportunities. Same thing with marriage. People are married 20, 30, 40 years and your marriage is still in, in the first year of marriage. You haven't developed your marriage to where it could go. So this gives a tremendous opportunity, just like, and just like everything in life is an opportunity, but it gives a tremendous opportunity for real amounts of growth. And the secret to what we do besides teaching, you know, a chasen or a kala, is that most of the people that come to us for like counseling or guidance are are really married 10, 20, 30, 40 years. You know, I had a couple recently that was in their 80s. So they're not newlyweds that are coming in and saying, okay, teach me. There are people that are, you know, 50 years old, 60 years old. Hold on. I just want to break that down. It probably takes a lot of courage and strength for someone to be like, we're in the 80s. I don't know how old you are, but you're clearly not in your 80s. <laughs> and to sit down with you and say, we have to be open. We're, we're having some challenges. And, and like kudos to them to so like trying to pursue a better relationship. But yeah. I think I mean, 80s for sure, because usually as people age, they, they tend to be more locked into their ways. Right. Right. Kids are even much in more. Your 30s. Yeah. I was going to say, right. even when right. you're younger, right. the ability to walk into somebody's house and say, I really could use some help or some guidance is, I think it takes a lot of inner strength to do that. More often than not, it's one party that's, pulling mm. you know yeah can we go speak to somebody but i look at it that it's 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 we deal with a lot of great people that i'll call it they're, they're lacking the education so they didn't do anything wrong you're, there's nothing wrong with it it's not a stigma you're you're coming to somebody and saying listen there's a natural imbalance between men and women we're different creatures we have to acknowledge that and therefore i got married thinking like i'm a great guy or a woman got married thinking I'm a great girl, it'll just work. I get along with all my friends. I get along with my parents. So naturally, this relationship should just work. But the reality is is that a man and a woman are very different creatures and putting them together creates a natural incompatibility. So learning to read another person's mind is very hard work. And the goal is not to read their mind as much as read their emotion and understand where they're coming from. He's usually more logical. She's usually more emotional. And then to be able to like decipher like what they're really saying and what their needs are and then to be able to give it to them. So most couples that are coming, yes, it takes a lot of strength to come. But what I find is that most of them leave much happier than when they came in as opposed to- I would like, hope. <laughs> yeah, no, no. A lot of people go to go, go to marriage counseling mm. in, in certain uh, dynamics, like with certain professionals. Their whole goal there is conflict resolution. So the whole session, they're actually coming out worse because mm. they're fighting with each other the whole time. They're like, okay, Stacy, now yell at him, but nicely. Okay, Mark, you know, validate her feeling. And, and they come out, they're like, oh, I hate you. I forgot that story. But now that I brought it up, mm. you know, I really, and, and it just opens up those old wounds. With what we do, it's very forward looking. 
it's a very forward looking process. It's like, don't you understand your spouse's needs? Don't you understand what your spouse is really, really saying to you? She's not upset about this. She's upset about that. And when you could understand that you did this wrong, now you can understand how to rectify it. So it's much more of a, of a forward looking process than- I think also my husband has in mind a lot that when he closes the door and they leave, they're going home together. <laughs> so he wants to keep, he always ends off more positive, focusing on the good. But he has it in mind, which I don't know when you go to marriage therapy, sometimes that's not it. It's like, okay, our time is up and right. you just destroyed each other for the past hour. I'll see you in a week. <laughs> <laughs> next week. Yeah. Make sure to pay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so interesting. And, you know, we have a, a show in Living the that's an issue where it's primarily mental health and relationships. And you both could clearly go on that show. But I'm like, you know what? There's a distinction because... They're generally, it's, it's now it's, we're talking to people with stories, but it's, it's technically people who are, you know, doctors and professionals. What's, what's been the, I guess, the pushback for, for you when you counsel? Like you're not a, in quotes, I mean, you're an accountant professional, but like you're not a professional. So like what, what's the pushback that people give to you and how do you respond to that? Right. So I, I'm very upfront with people that my certification is I'm a CPA and a CFF. I'm <laughs> a, 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 a tax accountant and a forensic accountant. That's my day job. That's my certification. Where I'm coming from, from a relationship perspective is, is very different than what a therapist might be focusing on. So if a therapist to me is, is, is almost like open heart surgery. You know, people do need therapy for a lot of things and it's, it's life changing. I send people to therapy all the time. But what's interesting is a lot of therapists send people to me all the time. And a lot of times I'll send people and I'll say, here, this person needs you. And they'll send them back. They'll say, no, this person needs you. Because what we do is very different models. I'm not uncovering um, childhood traumas or addictions or mental health. It's more of like the here and the now and the future. I'm focused on the windshield rather than the rear view mirror. So I'm very much, okay, I don't really care. Don't tell me another story of what happened five years ago or 10 years ago. I want to know what are you doing for your wife tonight, tomorrow, the next day. Like short attainable goals on a consistent basis with accountability will change anybody's life. Those three things, short attainable goals, consistency, and accountability. If you have those three things and you do something with enough time, you'll see a drastic change to your life. So whether it's going to the gym or going on a diet, right? Instead of talking 30,000 foot, uh, talk, talking about health, you just say, I'm going to eat this, this, and this, and I'm going to check in with my coach, and I'm going to do it every day for the next three months. You'll, you'll lose weight. You'll go to the gym. You'll have your trainer. You'll gain muscle. If you do this with marriage, you'll see a drastic change. So that's my focus. It's very different than um, than a therapist is doing. And the results, I think, are oftentimes like almost instant. Like I can tell you how many times I've seen like a light bulb go off in my office. Like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I didn't realize that I was doing that for 25 years. Like I didn't realize the underlying emotion or how unsettled that was making you or how you felt so abandoned. And yeah, it's it's a different model. It's a different model. It's very effective. I find it's very effective. And that's why we dedicate so many hours to it. But it's, you know, when people give pushback, I'm like, okay, you want to go to a therapist? So then go to a therapist. But at this point, when people come to me, they know, they know what, right. They, you know what I'm saying? They know who I am. They're not coming in and saying, um, oh my gosh, you duped me into thinking I was coming to a therapist. Like, you know, you're not, they don't do that. They understand exactly what they're getting and what they're not. And oftentimes I'll say like, stop, you're talking about something that's way out of my scope of practice. You need to go speak to somebody and have a great Rolodex of people that I can try to get you into. Yeah. So for, as a college teacher also, I don't necessarily meet with the couples. My husband's the one that meets with the couples. I usually am just coaching the girls and um, when they give me a scenario, something that they're struggling with, I always say, I'm talking to you, not to him. So I'm going to tell you different things to change up this little dance that you and your husband have been doing because people find that the arguments that they have just keep coming up over and over again. Let's teach how to change this dance a little bit. And by what you do as a change, something will probably change within the domino effect of your marriage. So with me, it's, I'm a college teacher. So it's, I'm just more like a coach. Um, versus being certified, but, um, but it's more coaching the girls along on their journey of how to make it work on their end. Yeah. I, I just want to add also that as much as there's a, a, a setback, I'll call it to not being certified. There's also some benefits to not being certified. You know, the ability to say your mind, um, is something that a therapist would have a hard time perhaps doing. You I mean, a therapist, they might say that, yeah, I could really say my opinion, but they know that there's a certain liability involved with that. Um, you know, I had recently, like a few weeks ago, I had, I had three couples that came to me, you know, deciding if they should keep their marriage date or if they should call off their wedding. 
And I have to give my opinion on each one. I think you should get married or shouldn't get married. And that's not an uncommon scenario where people come and they say, you know, we like you to tell us what we should do or give us guidance with what we should do. Um, therapists, again, I don't mean to speak for any therapist, but they carry a little bit more liability. Like, how did you say that? Or you might be sued for, you know, giving something like that, which of course anybody could sue anybody. But the idea is that we, we, we're not as beholden to those rules. If I feel that somebody's a bad relationship for somebody else, I'll say, I'm sorry. I think you guys, you know, this is a very poor idea. Um, I had once where there was a couple that was extremely toxic. They were sitting in our house yelling and screaming. It was a few days before the wedding. Um, we got called the parents and everyone got involved. And they said, okay, you know, but you guys are not licensed. We're going to ask a therapist to give a review. And the therapist met with the couple and the therapist said, well, how do you feel? And how do you feel? And how do you feel? And just would not go on record as saying that this was a really bad idea. And when I spoke to the therapist, they were like, what am I supposed to do? My hands are tied. I, I'm not allowed to say what I really think. I said, well, what do you really think? Like, well, off the record, this is a terrible marriage, <laughs> but I, I can't say those words. So, you know, the parents were like, well, if they didn't say that you should call it off, then we're going to continue going, which it was their decision, obviously, and everybody should live and be well. But the bottom line is by us, we're allowed to say what we feel. And oftentimes that translates into really helping people from very disastrous situations. It could be also about getting divorced. Like we feel that this is really toxic and you need to extricate yourself from these circumstances as opposed to like, well, how do you feel about mm -hmm. the fact that this is going on? So it does le lead to a little bit more of like a, uh, a openness that we're able to talk to people. Yeah. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but I am very excited to tell you all about Pick Purple primarily because I lived in a building in Farakway. And I don't know, every three weeks or something like that, there would be a ton, tons of garbage bags, white garbage bags with the words written in a marker, pick purple. And I was pretty confused. I'm like, what is this? I went to my wife and she told me, she's like, oh, we actually gave a bunch of our stuff to pick purple. I'm like, what's pick purple? She's like, it's very simple. Pick Purple is a nonprofit organization that helps people in need and they take the clothing and sometimes they give it directly to them. Sometimes they sell it and like you could buy a gorgeous suit for a dollar because someone's like, hey, I don't need this anymore. And they help those in need who don't have clothes. Basically taking your in quotes, garbage or clothing that you're like, I don't need this anymore. Of course, don't like give them your like totally ripped up shirt, but give them the clothes that you're not wearing anymore. And those in need will get it at an incredible price. Again, they're a nonprofit. And when they make money off anything that they sell or give to others, well, I should say sell, then what happens is they take that money and it all goes towards Project Batya, which Pick Purple is under. Batya essentially helps girls who are in high schools, who are struggling, who need a, you know, it's care of, it help them connect more to their Judaism and to their Jewish roots. And it obviously helps those girls more than just in high school, literally throughout their life. Batya is a beautiful project. So Pick Purple is amazing because I think most importantly, your clothing that you have that you're not going to wear anymore or it's just going to sit in your closet for another like five months to 10 years will actually be worn by people in need and those people in need will actually benefit and at really, really great reduced prices. And of course, the proceeds from that all go directly to Batya to help those girls find their Jewish roots. So it's a win, win, win. And the process, I kid you not, I did this before because I literally have stuff to give Pick Purple because we've been using it for now, I don't know, like four years, is so simple. Go to pickpurple.org and you will literally follow it out. They'll say, oh, the process is so simple. They go, they pick it up from you. They take it from your house. You put it in like a garbage bag. You mark it as Pick Purple. They drop it all put it outside your house from 9 a.m. to, I don't know, 5 p.m., someone will come pick it up. Bada bing, bada boom. You don't need to do anything. Better service than the garbage man. They actually come to your door. And actually, it goes to people in need. So go to pickpurple.org. We know Pesach's coming up, so you probably are cleaning up. And that tells me why we should talk about Twillery now, because Pick Purple is <laughs> complimentary, because you might be thinking, hey, I need an update to my wardrobe. I want to get clothing that's actually going to last that I don't need to throw out or give away. And that's why I love Twillery. And personally, I have been, I have like 20 pairs of pants, not from Twillery, that they're great pairs of pants. And I'm like, but I'm not wearing, I haven't worn them since I started advertising for Twillery. That's why I gave them pick purple. But Twillery's pants 
last. I've said this before. I have pants that lasted me for over five years. I am right now, um, the Shavasim rocking their ear suit, which is this brilliant technology just makes this suit breathable. I kid you not, you probably will not want to wear other suits after that. Um, so go ahead and check that out. But you're thinking, hey, do I still get that discount? Yes, you do. You get $18 off with the code word INSPIRE. Get their ear suit, get their pants. We're going to talk about their other incredible items, their shirts, their polos, so much more next week. Now back to our conversation with Rabbi Ruving and Getty. What's the biggest challenge that you find couples face? Or most common? Yeah, most common. So I'll start just with yeah. the girls because I see sometimes... Um, when girls just just get married, let's start with like the newlywed. And I think that if unless they work on themselves in this aspect, then it could really carry through. Where it, it takes some time to be able to accept the other person's opinions and and their viewpoint on things. A lot of times, people, especially in the newlywed stage, are holding on to their individuality, which individuality in marriage is beautiful. But if that is going to come with not being able to hear the other person's opinion or not being able to respect the other person, then it's going to come into a big conflict unless you really learn to be flexible, be open, be able to hear things from the other person's perspective. Um, and you never know when you do, your world really expands. When you thought something should be like this and then your husband or the wife expands you to this, your whole life changes. But it takes that that piece of being able to be more flexible in your brain instead of just, you know, no, 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 but I said and my family and this is how I versus let me hear what you have to say and giving the validation that this other person who you married is smart and respectable and is going to bring tremendous things to your marriage versus just seeing things just with your blinders on. So I think like if there was there was more respect for the other person and what they stood for then I think things would be a little bit easier. I, I always say, I just want to, I have my own answer, but you're touching on something which is so, it's so true in our marriage. It's, it's, I mentioned before, like my wife and I could not be more different. Yeah. It, it's like incredible. Like when people meet us, they're like, <laughs> like, like, how are you guys doing? You know, like we're, we're, we're so, I'm so, I'm so, I don't want to call rigid because in many ways I'm not rigid, but I have like this certain structured. You're very structured. Very good. Thank you. Don't Thank worry. you. I'm very structured. And my wife is uh, not, so not so structured, <laughs> right? So it, it, the, the ability, and this is something that struck me when I was sitting with a couple recently, the ability for a couple to take two extremes and then create a new unit, which has both dynamics is I think one of the, one of the deepest um, concepts of marriage, mm -hmm. meaning to say, and it's really what you're saying. It's, it's, if I'm, let's say I'm rigid, right? And my wife is, is not, and she's like, yeah, it's fine, right? So when it comes to sitting down to the Shabbos meal, it, if it's my way, then I would go crazy, right? Cause my kids are jumping around and they're spilling wine, right? If it's my wife's way, this is amazing. This is great, right? Everyone, like, you know, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. It's great. No problem, right? And one of us is going to come out of the meal very like jaded like what do you mean why weren't the kids sitting or the or my wife would be like the kids were sitting it was so boring like there was no you know if you add both elements you say you know what let's figure out how what i have is a strength and what you have is a strength and let's have a meal where there's a certain amount of structure and a certain amount of spontaneous fun and we're just going to make make it like the middle of the gate i mean the, the the meal we clear the table and we play a game with the kids we do that a lot of times on chavez and there's a certain amount of like there's fun and there's structure and a lot of things in life where there's where there's opposites, it almost seems like there's a certain amount of like conflict. It doesn't have to be conflict. If there's real respect for the other person, you can have both sides of things and then it creates this beautiful dynamic, like a balanced approach. The logic and the emotion is, is a great example, right? You, every couple needs a logic and you need emotion. Somebody who's spending a lot of money and somebody who's watching out for that money. It doesn't have to be a conflict. It could be two people who say, wow, I really appreciate that you keep us fiscally responsible. And I don't want to say, I really appreciate that you make us have a nice house and everything is beautiful. You create a budget and you work together. Two people that are opposite doesn't mean that they have to fight with each other. You can often have like a really beautiful side of the relationship. Can I just yeah. bring out a point? No. <laughs> Next question. No, yeah, please, 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 really, please. really good point, okay? Sure. Let's go. Is that a lot of us label someone as being rigid or as being very chilled or as being, you know, thrifty or being spending all their money. But there's nobody in the world who's always one way. 
And when you label someone as being a certain way, that is how the, that's going to be the lens in which you view that person. So I, I challenge everybody to do mm-hmm. this is that when you, let's say my husband labeled as rigid, if I would just structure, structure, we will have my structure, which is really a beautiful thing. And I really appreciate it. And it gives me tremendous amount of security and I see all the benefits to it. But if I would like, you know, step back and view him that he actually is very chill. There are so much, there's so much of him that is very chill, specifically with me and my chillness. <laughs> um, but he's, he's very lucid with certain things. If I start looking at him with that, lens then i see more of that and even with me me being as you know relaxed and flighty if you want to call it there's so much about me that's also very very structured i'm very structured with my kids i'm structured with the with appointments with them with my kalas i don't miss i don't double book i'm very very structured so but if you look at me you just look at me as like oh she's just so chill she's nothing bothers her things do bother me sometimes Mm. so it's it's nice to have that lens that there's nobody who is always so when you label he's always angry that's not true he's always mean that's not true he's always rigid that's not true there's always going to be a balance you just have to look for it and you could do this you could take a notes app on your phone and start finding the times that your husband or wife did the opposite of what you label them. So if you, this our example, if you think he's too structured, find the times when he's really not. And oh, he was so chilled with the kids today. Oh, he, you know, he didn't care that I dented my car. That might be <laughs> a recent event. A recent event. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a certain, you, when you view it like that, then what you look at, your perspective really changes things. So instead of labeling, Label the other way and you'll get to the middle. No, I was like, I thought it was called bumper cars. That's, that's why you have the bumper. Yeah. Um, no, but I want to say I was, uh, you know, I learned by Rabbi Berkowitz in Eretz Israel and he has three minute meetings with his tummy them every day. You can go in for three minutes. Um, there's only five people that could go in. So there's a sign up sheet and you could sign up only once a week. So there's basically, you know, like 20 meetings a week. And then he has longer ones, but the three minute meetings were ways for you to go in ask a question really quick and then just get an answer. So what guys used to do is they would ask people who went in, you know, if you have um, something that you don't mind sharing with everybody, do you mind just when you come out, just tell it to whoever it is and they'll write it down and then we can compile all of our Berkowitz's questions and answers. So there was one guy who went in and he came out and he was like, he was like very like moved by the three minute meeting and our Berkowitz has a timer and it rings and then the next guy just pulls you out. So this guy, he said he came in and he he asked our Berkowitz, he said, um, he said, Rebbe, Rebbe, what should I do? My wife is very lazy. That was his question. So what's that like three seconds? So he said, Rebbe Berkowitz sat there and he said, she's, she's lazy. Mm-hmm. She's lazy. So you summed up your wife <laughs> as lazy. That's everything about her is lazy. She's just lazy. And he said for like two minutes and like 50 seconds. <laughs> That was all Robert Woods kept repeating. So she's lazy. That's 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 the way you view her. You view her whole essence, all of her goodness, all of her everything is just lazy. And then like the last three seconds before the clock expired, he said, she's not just lazy. <laughs> and then beep, 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 and he got pulled out of the room. And he came on, he was like, whoa, he just changed my whole perspective on my wife. Like we tend to look at people, kizekala adam, like this is the entirety of the person. It's not. There's a lot of goodness to every single person. And when we focus on that negativity, it, it tends to just be like they're like my wife was saying, like they're always this or they're never this. And I would take it a step further, which is usually why are they like this? Why are they upset all the time? Like maybe you should listen to what they're really saying to you. You know, I think one of the biggest misnomers of marriage is that communication is the key to marriage. Now, if we were married and I said to you, Yako, I hate you. You're terrible. You're the worst person in the world. You make my life miserable. I have a great communication. <laughs> <laughs> so our marriage is not struggling because of that. What people usually talk about communication, it's a lack of understanding. So when a person is upset all the time, ask yourself why? And most, most often people just diagnose them. Oh, they, they have anger issues and they're, you know, they give this like radical extreme mental health reason to why people are acting the way they're behaving. But maybe that's not the reason. Maybe he's really stressed at work. Maybe he feels like you don't support him enough. You know, there's a million examples. Maybe he has a financial pressure, maybe his boss or whatever the reasons are. And it, it starts really also with our children. You know, your kid gets off the bus and he's in a bad mood. Like, like you don't kill your kid. You realize like 
he probably had a bad day. Maybe somebody bullied him. Maybe he just flunked the test. Maybe he has a test. You know, you get to the underlying, like what's really going on with the person. You, you just bring out like the panemius, like the inside of, of that person. And I think that almost as much or maybe more than people want to be loved, they want to be understood. And when a person feels understood, like, oh, this must be what's bothering you, it usually takes off that negative energy. They don't feel the need to like be emoting so much negativity because they, oh, you got the message already. Okay, good. Now I could calm down. So more often than not, that's really what's going on. Well, it's interesting because I think typically with fights in marriage, it's like me versus you or, you know, one person versus the other person. And the approach you're taking is technically like, no, no, we're on the same team. Let me understand whatever struggle you're going through and let me help it basically. A million percent. Every couple is on the same team and, and you're saying it, you're saying it exactly right. It's not me versus you. Whenever a couple starts talking to me and the, and the guy says, well, I, and she'll say, well, I, I say, guys, whoa, whoa, let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop. We, it's, it's we, it's us. We're talking about this new thing here called a marriage. What does our marriage need? Our marriage needs more time. Can we agree? Yeah. Our marriage needs real dedication. Um, you know, during the week we need a, I hate saying this, like we need date night. It's not just about date night. It's I, I want to spend time with you. It's I really want to go out with you. I'm taking the time to, to do something that you, that interests you. I want to understand you, etc. All the things that a marriage needs. Don't talk about me versus you. It's me and you. We are struggling. Why are we struggling? Usually because our needs are not being met. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll say to a couple, instead of saying to the husband, I don't like giving direct, um, like rebuke to people. I'll, I'll more talk about the marriage. So I'll mm. say, well, doesn't our marriage need more time? Like our grass is not being watered. It's going to die. Right. So doesn't our marriage need more time? Yeah. Okay. So which one of us needs to contribute to this? Okay. The husband. Right. Okay. Doesn't our marriage need us to calm down a little bit? Cause one of us is being like a little bit. And the wife will be like, yeah, that's me. I, I need to do that. And then we like can figure out the roles so that this new entity called the marriage can become successful. Here's, that's an here's another thing is this is a, if a couple is arguing about something, okay, they should take a pause if they're in the right headspace to do this. And each of each other should take the other person's position for, for like three minutes. Mm -hmm. So hard to do it's that. It's so hard to do this. But it gives a tremendous amount of validation to the other person. And sometimes once that person's mind is like open to the fact like, wait, I'm talking as if I'm her and this is how she's feeling. There's a little bit more of understanding and compassion when they're talking. Yeah. So it's a very difficult thing to do. But yeah. if you do it, there's tremendous, like I'm taking your, your position, you're taking mine. Yeah. It's, it's, it's true. And also I'll say like saying that saying the negative is also one of the most powerful marriage tools, which means most, most people, I think, would say that in marriage, you want to be positive, right? A lot of compliments and a lot. That's true. But if I'm upset and my wife just keeps saying like, Oh, okay. We're good. Yeah. I'm going to get more upset because you don't clearly understand what I'm upset about. Mm -hmm. If you say the negative, it will diffuse the situation a thousand times more than any I'm sorry. The word I'm sorry usually means I'm sorry that we're in this situation. If I say the negative, it means that I turn to you and I say to you, I, you must be really mad that I didn't get off the phone when you came home. You must be really mad that I didn't call you before I came home. You must be really upset about this. I, I'm telling you your side. It's extremely validating. It's extremely validating and it, it, it usually diffuses the negativity because I have no more reason to be upset. Yeah, you get it. Great. Now that you get it, I feel understood. Usually you could work through this very quickly. So saying the other person's angle, like if let's say, if let's say somebody's going on vacation and the two of you can't agree where to go, it's not you versus her. It's the two of you have two valid options. You want to go to Florida. She wants to go to Cancun. Literally, hold on. We literally, if my wife and I were talking about this, she's like, oh, what are we going to do with the, our son has off and he's like kind of finally old enough to maybe appreciate it. And she's like, oh, let's go to like Colorado. I'm like, Colorado is three years old. Like <laughs> she's not going to appreciate that. She's like, yeah, but I will. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe Florida is just, or let's just stay home. Like, I don't know. Right. And it was just this, well, you didn't conclude it yet, but maybe I'll, I'll learn skills so, here. So, so the skill is simple. You yeah. take a paper and you just write down Colorado. You take a paper and you write down Florida and take a third pa paper and you write down staying at home, staycation, right? Yeah. And then it's not, forget what you said. Mm -hmm. Forget that you're the one that brought up Florida and she brought up Colorado. Your marriage now has three valid options. Your marriage mm -hmm. has three valid options because hopefully you're not going to go to Florida while she goes to Colorado and you're going to do together. Yeah. Okay. You're going to do this together, right? Because that's what a married couple does. So now 
you're going to write down all the positive things about Florida. Florida, it's warmer and Florida has kosher, whatever. You'll write down all those positive things. And then you will take the side of Colorado and you'll say, what would be awesome about Colorado? Well, honey, I researched it and they have amazing mountains and they have skiing and they have all the stuff that, you know, you might be interested in going. Now, at this point, you may not really want to go to Colorado, but at least for her, she's hearing that you're stepping onto her paper for a minute. And you'll see she'll step onto your paper for a minute when she takes the Florida thing and says, well, I researched it and we could go to an alligator show there and all the stuff that Florida has to offer. Most of the time, there won't be a negative charge in that conversation because it's me and you with two valid options. Then you can make it fun. We're going to mix up the papers and pick one out or, you know, we're going to think through which one and we'll come up with a budget. We can only spend $3,000. Well, which one fits into our budget? You can now, as a group, make a decision, which is not what most couples do. And also what this does again mm-hmm. is, is it expands your world. So instead of just seeing things narrowly like this, right. you have someone who's smart and loves you who's coming up with something totally different instead of shunning it, embrace it. Like this is going to expand my world. I was never in Colorado. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. And it's hard. I know what I'm saying is hard. It's not just the easy thing. Let me just expand my world. (laughs) But if you take a step back and you realize that it's, you're not the only one in this marriage, you have two people who are both validating each other and respect each other. It really does expand your world to, to listen again with me and my husband. (laughs) I became so much more structured because of him instead of just like, you know, randomly I'll walk into his office and I'll be like, let's go to Florida for the weekend. <laughs> and he'll be like, um, we have twins and we have this and this and this and we can't. I said, okay. And I, so this he, is like a daily occurrence. It really does happen. Um, but, and even my own spontaneity has rubbed off on him too. So it, you could really expand your world by living with someone either who is the same, but even more so with someone who's different than you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing because I think it's another added thing with this is that um, a lot of times when you look at something negatively in your spouse, right away you say it's all bad, it's all bad. But there are tremendous benefits to your husband or your wife's personality being the way that it is. You just have to find it. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Um, uh, let's let's go an example. Let's say somebody is doesn't spend a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or you know, I have a better example. Okay. Let's say you think that your husband is is a little bit like he's like a not so warm. Okay. okay? Cold. He's not so warm. He's a little colder. Um, and he's a little sharp with his tongue, which is not nice. And he should work on himself. But let's say that's his personality. Okay. So you could look at him and be like, it's not nice. He doesn't validate me and he doesn't express himself and I'm okay so that's looking at the drawback of that because everything that you have has benefits and drawback but where is his personality actually benefiting you in your life so you step back and you say well his personality makes us a lot of money (laughs) and he's working super hard and his personality is actually giving us a lot of money um, or the opposite let's say you said I wish my husband was was not as sensitive and not as emotional um, but then if he wasn't, then he would be not as expressive to you and maybe out of the house more. Hmm. So every single situation that you have in your life has drawbacks and benefits to it. Everything, even something that looks good, there's going to be a drawback. Like hmm. even when we go away on vacation, which is beautiful and amazing, there's drawbacks. I miss my kids. Someone else has to move into the house with the kids and there's going to be drawbacks. You know, I, we might miss our flight <laughs> depending on who's the one getting us to the airport. There's things that may happen as long as you set yourself up to realize that even the good things has some drawbacks. The bad things also have benefits to it. You have to find it. Even with halafos of marriage, the halafos nida, it could be very, very difficult for someone. You know, we're separating physically for a long time. This is how I express and feel love. There's tremendous benefits. You have to find them for yourself. That renewal, that re-energetic, you know, um, that re-energetic, what's the word, when you're coming back together. You have that in the system. So even the things that are hard for you, it's good for you. Even the things that are good, there's going to be a balance. And when you have that expectation that not everything is going to be all awesome or all bad, then you're going to, you're going to be much more balanced in your expectation, which actually brings me to something. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Where I read an article in the Mishpacha in September and it was the article on, um, the Palais. Now, the Palais were a family in Eretz Israel who lost two sons in a terror attack. And they wrote up this beautiful article on her, and she was able to see the benefits, which is, is so crazy, to this terrible tragedy that she had. Listen, she 
was expecting. Her husband was in the hospital, wasn't even aware while she was sitting shiva for her, her kids. The entire world, the entire Eretz Yisrael rallied around her. They had set up a tent because there were so many people coming to be Menachem Mabel, her, a really, really, really from lady. And this whole article was just absolutely beautiful on her being able to see the, the benefits. And this is our whole thing, you know, of being able to see the benefits and drawbacks. And even this whole thing that happened in Eretz Yisrael, which is so horrific, the balance of that is all the achdos and everything. There's always going to be something because everything that Hashem does is tov. So one of the things that I had in the article was she has a saying in her house, which is, don't say oof, say parakuf. And what parakuf is, is Mizra Lasoda. And instead of you stub your toe, instead of going, oh gosh, and screaming or whatever, being upset, Ms. Rilasoda, thank you, Hashem, for everything that I have in my life. So when you start training your brain that even with the bad stuff, I'm going to turn to Hashem and say, Ms. Rilasoda, then the harder things are easier to deal with than just stubbing your toe. So we had this. I, I, I was very into this Ms. Rilasoda. And, and don't say oof, say parakuf. And my son, he needed stitches. And as we were driving through the stitches, he goes, Ma, we have to see Ms. Melissa, which was just so amazing. So I actually had these magnets made. Oh, no way. Um, it says, don't say oof, say parakuf. I said, Ms. Melissa, Soda, just in case people don't know what kuf is, it's Ms. Melissa. Soda. We even made a website that if you- Yeah, what's the scan, website? Can you read it? It's sayparakuf.com. And it even has one of these, you know, you just scan and it takes you straight to the website. That's and really what cute. it has is, is Ms. Melissa Soda on it. So if you don't know it by heart, it will say it. And it has a link to this beautiful, beautiful article that I have. I really recommend people to read because it's this idea of even in tragedy, there is, there is a benefit, which is, which is a total mindset shift. So taking that down more practically, not just in, you know, horrific tragedy, but even things that you have going on in your life, there's going to be benefits. Sometimes you'll have to wait later to see the benefit, but there's going to be benefit because Hashem gave it to you. So having that mindset is a real game changer. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Before you ask the next question, I just want to sure. say, it just, it just dawned on me that, you know, one of your first questions was, how do we get into this? And this, this um, magnet is such a great example of like my wife, like picking like an idea and like making it like a practical part of like our kids' lives and our lives. So I, I just, it just dawned on me like, which woman just makes magnets? I got a random. And my and wife texted me. She's like, by the way, I just made magnets and it's going to cost us like X amount of dollars. I'm like, are you selling them? She's like, no, I'm just going to give them out for free to anyone who wants. I'm like, oh, okay. Fine. Sounds great. We gave them out to Judaica Square in Lakewood, specifically the South. So if anyone wants to get them. But I also want to give a shout out to Shani Rosenberg, who's one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. She's the one that's recording all she's of this. She's managing the whole camera system. Thank and you, Shani. she's so talented. She's the one that did the graphic. It's really good. She got on board with me. I want to put it on my car. I, yeah, I have I, one. We're going to plaster your car. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> that's really nice. My favorite moment from this entire episode is coming up. But first, let me tell you about our friends. Two friends that are going to help your business in very different ways. First off, Hiring for Less. Thank you for all of those who've heard about them in the past episodes that reached out to them and actually got 50% off their first week. And more than that, Hiring for Less is essentially a way that you could find the next full-time employee. They're overseas. They speak really good English and Hiring for Less walks them through to the needs that you have. So I get very often asked about photo editors and video editors. Boom, Hiring for Less could help you get the right video editor. Or you're going to say, I need a graphic designer or I need someone to help me with my accounting or my data entry. Whatever it is that you don't need to actually be doing to run your business, but someone who could be trained in could do, you could get an employee from Hiring for Less. And they're just seven dollars an hour but the fact of them that i love the most is that they there's no like hidden fees or like seven dollars um, um uh, seven dollars an hour plus the two hundred dollars a week no it's seven dollars an hour that's how much you pay and it's literally 280 a week of course you're gonna get your first week for 50 percent off when Wait. you call and say hey living with Chaim sent me their phone number is 845-682-0990 or of course you could hit them up at hiring the number four less.com the link in the show notes you could call them you could whatsapp them you could text them they're very great and easy to deal with and you all are doing things in your business that you don't need to be doing or you know what it could be like your life right you're, you're like i need help managing my schedule and and i have so many things going on and i have a a wig salon and i have so much i need customer service support boom hiring for less will get you 
the help that you need. And there are so many more examples that I didn't even mention. So go to their website to see what it is. And if you're not sure, call them, ask them, talk it through. I got a few thank yous from people saying like, by the way, it was just so easy to deal with hiring for less. So go ahead, give them a call, look at their website and very soon you for just $7 an hour could have your next employee. Now, let me tell you about my friends at Bippy. But first, I'm gonna snap my fingers and magically we'll have a guest appearance with someone helping me talk about Bitbean. Here we go. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first, I'm Ellie Langer, and I've hijacked an ad script on my brother's uh, podcast. I'm gonna tell you about Kol Chabad and Kosher Money one week. You won't even be ready. You can that. join me on a podcast. Ad. Ad, read. Sponsorship. But this one's about Bitbean. Mm -hmm. We have unique business owners listening to this, and they need unique software, right? Gone are the days where you have to Google software for my medical service company and then look at a list of the top 10 providers and use whatever it is they have with some changes using a developer overseas. No, you have to be smarter. You're going to use the Silicon Valley of the Jewish world. This is Bitbean. Throw out the scotch tape. No more duct tape, the glue. You need software that works the way you want it to. Mm. So you have an introductory meeting with them. They learn about your needs. They learn about your business. And then more and more businesses are signing up, right? These aren't necessarily the small businesses. If right. you're looking for a website that does a very basic thing, that that's not the right fit here. Right. This is for medium to larger size businesses. And the reason I know that they have happy customers is that I looked at some of their client lists and you have the same owners coming back for new projects. Mm. You don't do that if you're not happy. Right. So highly recommend you check it out, bitbean.com. There are those that love case studies and that's what you need to do. There are so many different types of business owners listening. Sure. Sure. You can have people in the healthcare space, in the food space, the nonprofit space. You need unique custom solutions as it relates to your donors, as it relates to your vendors, right? There are so many different elements. And then as business picks up, you don't want to be thinking about software. You want to be thinking about your business. Sure. And that's where Bitbean comes in. They're amazing. And and something you didn't even mention yeah. that I want to bring up is they're also so easy to work with because they're nice and they're also very intelligent. So they help solve your problems. Would you say I'm intelligent? Yeah. Now back to this week's episode. I'm so curious, as someone continues on with their marriage, five years, 10 years, obviously, you know, hopefully they have children. And do you see that children, I guess, get in, not necessarily get in the way, but the couple kind of puts their children before their relationship? Is that a bad thing? And how often does that happen? So I want to be careful how, how this comes out, but... You know, I think the number one issue in marriage is distraction. That doesn't mean that your children are a distraction, but if your focus in terms of your giving, your time, your energy, your emotions is going to be with your children first and your spouse second, which tends to happen because kids have a lot of needs that are pressing and time sensitive, then you're going to feel those repercussions. Um, I always say that, you know, we have very busy schedules to me when I like look at my daily calendar and my nightly calendar is, is, is public. People just put themselves into my calendar, have like a link and then people pass it around. Then everyone just puts themselves in. So I don't even know who I'm meeting till I look at my morning schedule. Okay. Here's my day. So she runs my, my secretary, she runs my, my daily schedule and then my nightly schedule. But to me, it's where does my wife fit in and where does my kids fit in? And of course, where do I fit in? You know what I mean? Where are the things that I need for my own just sanity that I'm not going to, you know, fall apart. So, which is so important. You want to share some things that you do my for your little family? hobbies. <laughs> well, There's many, and it's, it's so important for someone to have that, especially yeah. women, by the way, who put usually everyone in front of themselves. Right. It's in order for them to be a person to actually give, they have to do things and prioritize themselves, you know. For sure. Make themselves self care, if you want to call it. And self care doesn't have to be a manicure, or it could be. But it's something that makes you feel internally fulfilled. The word is CPUF, where you really, really feel fulfilled in your life. And um, it's crucial for husbands and wives to have it. Yeah, but I think that the ability to make sure that you have your own 
I'll look at it like batteries, that your own batteries are full. They don't have to be 100%, but they have to be enough to be able to give to somebody else. So figure that 60, 70% maybe. Um, and then you have your wife or your husband, and then you have your children. And what most people tend to do is, um, if you just ask somebody, just put your schedule on a piece of paper and then ask yourself, where does your spouse fit in? 90% of the time, it's like, oh, uh, I don't know, like, you know, like when we're collapsing at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> we like say, hi, how are you? You know what I mean? There's not like real quality time. And, you know, over here we have like a two mile loop, which we go walking all the time. Um, I like photography. So sometimes I'll just get out there and just like go and walk into the woods and just like take pictures of different stuff. Um, I have different hobbies, you know, it could be exercising, the different things that just like allow me to charge my own batteries, have time quality, me and my wife, or, and then I'll send it to kids. I take my kids on dates, like every one of them has like a designated time, like, okay, Tuesday at six o'clock, me and you, we're going out, we're going to have to eat. The kids live for it. They're like, I want a date, I want a date. It's like, okay, one second, (laughs) you know, like I'm going to put you in in the calendar. And they know like, this is me and you. And we usually make like a budget. You could buy stuff. You can go to this toy store, whatever it is, or go out for food or ice cream. How do they not go to the toy store every single time? No, no. Oh, you they, said ice cream. It's like very, it's interesting. They like, a lot of times they like just sitting and talking mm. like about their day, their friends, um, what they have upcoming going on, you know, and, and again, different ages is different things. So maybe like the younger one, sometimes what I'll say is, listen, let's go out to either eat or ice cream or pizza or whatever. And then I'll say like, okay, and on the way back, we'll stop somewhere and get you like a small toy or something, or we'll go to like a, like an outdoor mall or something where you could do both, you know, mm. like we'll get this and then we'll stop and we'll get you something. But it's not about like, I spent a thousand dollars on you. It's, you're, you're spending $5, $10. It's the idea that like their father and their mother independently wants to spend time with you and really cares about your life and your day and your friends and your teachers. You don't have to do it once a week. Cause if you have, you know, five kids, that means, you know, every <laughs> night you're doing that with somebody, you do it once every few weeks. It really gives like a charge to the relationship. And then I always say, it pays itself off in dividends because your kids are not as needy. Your spouse is not as needy because their needs are actually being filled. So I think that a lot of times people say to me, oh, my, my wife is so naggy and she's always fetching. And she, the answer is because you're not giving her anything. If you gave her what she needs, she would stop fetching. Listen to what she's saying to you. She's saying to you, dear, you're amazing. You're so dedicated to your job. You're so dedicated to other people. I wish you were just as dedicated to me. And I wish you prioritized me and made me, you know, number one in your life. If you did that, you wouldn't hear so much complaining. So it, it's, it's, it, it's something that pays itself off in dividends. And people always say, I don't have time for my wife. No, no, you have time for your wife because she will get that time from you. Some way, somehow she will get that time from you. And it usually will come at the expense of a business meeting or some time that you're like in a crunch and so we keep calling you or nagging you or like making a big deal about something. And children do the same thing also. When your kids come home and they're dancing around and they're going crazy, it's a, it's a call for attention yeah. and they will get your attention. Something <laughs> will break or something will smash in your house because your kids realize like, I need your attention. My batteries are empty. If you come home and spend a good 15 minutes with your family, usually like the, in, the, the needs of the house will yeah. settle yeah. to a normal good rate. If you come home and you're on the phone and you're pacing and you're giving the finger, the pointer finger <laughs> to everybody in your family and you're walking around, you're going like this their emotions are going to start rising. Their needs are going to start rising. And by the time you hang up that phone, it's going to be very overwhelming for you. Also for kids to see their parents pretty much being on the same page is is also a big deal for them to see that. So when they see husband or wife prioritizing each other, then um, that gives them something deep down, a security that, you know, giving them all the time, prioritizing them over your spouse can't give them. So growing up in a home where the mother and father both prioritize each other is actually very secure. It's a very good feeling for them. It makes them feel very secure. Yeah, I think a lot of people get married and they, their concept of marriage is what you saw in your home, right? Meaning you could go to a chassan class or a college class and that's 10 hours or 12 hours of information, but it's not going to undo 20 years, right? right, Of what you saw. So it's interesting because we were going out somewhere recently and my kids go, oh, you guys are going on a date. And I was like, I'm so happy to hear that. That means that my kids, understanding of you know us going out means oh you guys are going to prioritize each other and spend time with each other you know whereas a lot of kids like oh you have a wedding tonight or you have a dinner tonight or you have an event tonight like with our kids i was i was very happy to hear that like oh you guys are going on a date yeah we're going on a date that's that's great that means that they understand that that's what a husband and a wife do yeah. they go on dates our with each other just made us like a we just had our 17th wedding anniversary and they made us a whole 
video. Shiny, shout out to Shiny Rosenberg. <laughs> to help them with that, they were having secret meetings on the phone with her, getting this done. <laughs> and one of the things that they said about my husband was, "He takes us out on dates." That was one of the lines in their song. Yeah, it was very it's cute. It's very important. That's really cool. I feel like I'm getting like a good like Musser master class over here. <laughs> Uh, so uh, something I want to talk about, maybe a little uncomfortable, but but I, I would love to touch upon it, that in the beginning of your marriage, you, you guys didn't have children for for like a few four years, and years yeah. four and a half years, which isn't, you know, I mean, people go through that struggle, but how did you both approach it? So I don't want to speak on your behalf. You know, I think there was, we never looked at it like a struggle, I'll call it like, and people would say like, oh, you have like infertility, the way we dealt with it. And I, I just want to validate because we deal with a lot of couples that, you know, do not have children. A lot of people want to be saying like, we have infertility, we're part of a time or Boni Olam, we go to these events. We didn't do that. Like we were more like, we are a good, strong couple and just happens to be like, we just don't yet have our children. Like it's almost like the bus is late, you know, like where are your kids? Like, oh, they're on the bus. They just, <laughs> they just, the bus just hasn't come here yet. It was more of like that approach. Um, you know, rather than anything else, we realized like around our first anniversary, like, okay, if we're going to have some time alone without children, we're going to use this as an opportunity mm. and we're going to learn marriage. We're going to develop ourselves to the best of our ability. Um, we're just going to focus on like becoming the best versions of ourselves until I don't want to call them distractions, but until the next responsibility in our life, you know, comes about. And that was the way we approached it. So we would never. Uh, talk about like oh my gosh you know like there was no like self-pity there was not like didn't need I, I don't think like we needed like that chizuk of like people coming and like encouraging us we were just more like yeah we're good i remember once we we asked our neighbor we said you know you guys have a new like a newborn um maybe you guys want us to watch your kid for a few hours you guys could just get out they were like who we're like us they're like you're gonna watch our newborn we're like we're not going to steal your baby. <laughs> like we're just offering you like we could imagine that like a, a, you know, you have a newborn, probably very hectic. Like, just go out for a couple hours. They were like in shock. And it was it was like a legitimate thing. Like, yeah, we love babies. They're cute. But at this point in our lives, like, you know, we have a little bit more time than you have. So by all means, like guys, go go enjoy yourself. So we didn't offer to pay for whatever they were doing. We just <laughs> offered to watch their baby, you know. So for us, that was like sort of like our approach. And I think that it, it offered us like my wife always says it's like in her DNA that it was an opportunity. It was an, a real opportunity for us to like learn that, first of all, a lot of times in life, the answer is just no or not right now. This is not the time for you. And that for us became like a real thing. Like, okay, so you work on your Amuna, you work on your Bitachan, you work on your Tfila. There's no Tfila like somebody that's like in like a situation where like they really want something. You know what I mean? You don't take things for granted. And I think all these years later, you know, Baruch Hashem, we have five children right now. Um, you cherish your kids. You really cherish your kids. Like, you know, as much as kids can be hectic sometime and, and, you know, you could be like, okay, guys, settle down. Like you always look at your kids. You're like, whoa, like there's a certain something in there that's like real, like a real pining. Those years, like those emotions are always there. So you appreciate what you have. You don't take things for granted as much as, you know, maybe some other people do. So to us, it was like a very, I'll call it like a positive learning experience, right? It was, it was, it wasn't it was like positive. a positive. There was definitely disappointments along yeah, the way. Right. And our disappointments, we had great hadracha. We had a rav. We would go to him and he would, he would give us perspective that would turn things around. And I always say that many, many, many things in life, life is perspective. So if you change your perspective on one little thing, then things could be, could be a little bit smoother. So anytime we had a perspective of being down about, you know, something not working or whatever, we would go to our Rob and he would sit there and he would do that perspective shift for us. One of the things that he said, he said, you guys are such a good couple. He would give us that physic. And he would say, Hashem is waiting for that perfect neshama for you guys. And that just gave us such a perspective shift that it, it, it is true. Our children are really <laughs> delicious neshamas. Um, but I, I will say that when people are going through the struggle of infertility or anything, it could be so, so painful. It could be very, very difficult. Um, and usually it could take till you have that baby to look back and say, right. these were all the benefits. Mm. We had the time, we had the this, right. we had the that. And I think what was a little bit unique was that we did that while we were going through mm. it. We we're like, these are the opportunities that we have now. Yeah. Let's take it. And again, like I said, with the benefits, there was tremendous benefits to us having that time. I mean, I don't know if we would be doing this. For sure. You know, if we, if we didn't have that time to develop all these concepts and schmooze it out and have that, that that time before we brought in our delicious kids that um there's that no question 
if we had kids right away, you would never have heard the name Ruvain Epstein or Githy Epstein. <laughs> there's wow. no, there's no question yeah. in the world. There's no question. It, it was, it was obviously a divine design. There were so many things in our lives that yeah, were very by design, orchestrated. But not having children, there's no question in the world. We probably, I mean, just all the decisions that we made about staying in Israel, uh, just a million different things. You'd be like a billionaire accountant right now. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably. Right. You would hear, you know, or exactly. Something else, famous in another way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, but, but there was but, tremendous benefits to it, and it takes it takes a strong something to be able to see the benefit in the actual struggle that you're in. And when people call me for chizuk with things that they're going through, not necessarily fertility, but things that are a struggle for them, um, I say, call me when you're ready to hear, because you yeah. can't tell someone who's in a very terrible place, this, this is very good for you. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. Right. But when you're ready to hear, I could, we could take out an, again, a notes app, something like a, something in your phone to start writing all the benefits that this struggle and this Nisayan that you're going through right now is being for you. Maybe it's making you a stronger person. Maybe it's, it's preparing you for greatness. Maybe it's, it's so that people know who Ruben Epstein is and helping them with their marriages. There's so many benefits and it would be so good to be able to see the benefits in it rather than waiting 10 years later and saying, oh, that was so good for me. Right. And meaning in every moment, I think saying the words like, this is good. I always say that like one day we're going to look back, right? Because I'll say, Pasuk says, then we'll look back, right? And we're going to be like, wow, it was all orchestrated by Hashem. It was all good. Like, it's good now. You don't have to wait till later to figure out that it was good now. Everything really in life, and this is really my wife, by the way, this is her, this is like me talking through osmosis of living with such a positive person. Like really everything in life is it's really all good. Everything Hashem does is for good. Sometimes it's hard to see. Sometimes it's very painful. So we don't really like see the perspective, but the ability to like look at life and say, right now, this is good. I'm single. It's good. I'm married and I have a struggle. It's good. I don't have children. It's good. I have children and I'm struggling with a child. It's good. I'm dealing with whatever it is. It's good. I have a good friend. Um, you know, he had uh, a child who got very, very sick and he said he was sitting in a room with his child who ultimately passed away. And he was like, this is good. I have to figure out where it's good. And he, he found good. He said, I found good during Mincha. I was standing one day and I was davening the Yechidus, davening alone, just staring at a wall, no minion. He had no job. He was literally in a dark room with his daughter who was slowly, you know, her life was, was going. And he said, I realized that I connected to Hashem today during Mincha in a way, in a level that no, no person can connect on like just from the deepest of the deep place. And he said, that was the good. And he told me after she passed away, he said, my daughter, if I could bring her back, I wouldn't bring her back. What, Whoa. what she what she gave us, this connection to Hashem, this incredible connection, my perspective on money, on my other children, on my wife, it's on a, it's on a level that people could live a thousand years and they'll never get there. Uh, that blew me away. That was a person who's really living with a real perspective of everything is Lataiva. You know, and, it really starts with the little things. Like, I mean, stitches is not so little, but it's little in the perspective of all yeah, of this. Right. And with my son saying, let's name his Melisoda, as we're about to stitch him up, seven stitches, two internal was a big deal. Wow. Um, yeah, let's name his Melisoda. So it's the small things that could eventually lead to, you know, hopefully it's all good. Yeah. But, also, so much in our life, I, I think we, we tend to resist it. We tend to resist it. It's almost like there's this divine plan and we're resisting. We're resisting our spouse's personality. We're resisting our children's struggles. And like sometimes if you like accept it and you go like, yes, this, this is what's happening. I can't control this. I have to learn to accept like a real acceptance. Um, I always say that, you know, when it comes to marriage, there's the external and then there's the internal. And if I said to you, like, do you respect your spouse? Most people go, yeah, yeah, I respect them. Respect is really deep. Respect you can see in someone's eyes, the way they look at their spouse, the way they relate to their spouse. You know, do you love your spouse? Yeah, but like, are you like, is there an inner, like a pride that this is your spouse? Do you look at this person as the most important person in your world? That's inner work. That's not something that you do on the outside. You know, we see couples, we were joking once because we went to a wedding and there's a bunch of couples that we know and these couples are all really struggling. And at the wedding, there was five seats and five men and five women. So it was 10 people sitting on five seats. So it was like, they were all like smushed together, you know? And as we walked out, my wife started giggling. And I said, why giggling? She said, 
come on, we know what they're, what they're struggling with. Nobody does this at home. Like in public, like we put on this like ear, like, oh, we're so happy and oh, we're so happy. But like in, in, in the depth of what, what you're going on at home, you're not so happy. You're really struggling. So a lot of that inner work, I think is really where, you know, a person, their perspective really shines through. It's not just about the outside. Oh yeah, I did this for my wife or I did this nice thing today. It's no, how do you truly feel about them? Make a list of like all your spouse's positive things that they have. Your spouse has thousands of positive traits that you don't focus on on a daily basis. Nobody does because we see them 2D. We spend five minutes with them. We check off the box. I'm a good spouse. Yeah, you're, you're good, but you could be better. Yeah. Everybody could be better. And there's a certain amount of inner work that a person needs to go through. And any struggle that a person needs to go through, I like to say it breaks you a little bit. So if you have a cup and you're trying to pour something in the top, you can, you can get some stuff in there and it's nice. But when something's broken, you really get to the inside of whatever's in that in that flask. And when a person's broken, there's a certain amount of inside of panemius that is revealed. And that can really have like a, a very powerful effect on a person. So I think that like that struggle, the struggle of not having children right away, I don't like to call it infertility. I don't know why. I like to say like the struggle of like our children didn't get off the bus yet. Like they just, mm-hmm. Hashem just didn't deliver them. Like it wasn't their time yet. You know what I mean? Um, that struggle, I think, like, did develop us, you know, and, and most of the time, I think it's a subconscious development, I would say. No, you agree? I think it's mostly like a subconscious development. You know, even if you don't realize that you're changing, you're changing. In any struggle that you're going with, you know, if it's a single girl or if it's a couple, you don't realize that you're changing. And I think that it's important to have the awareness that you're changing and make sure that it doesn't change you for the negative. Mm-hmm. You don't get angry. You don't get resentful. You don't like get into that negative headspace. You say, this is Lataiva. This is good. Say Parakuf. Pay, say Not Parakuf. Old. Don't say off. And then if you're able to, if you're able to maintain that for a long enough time, then it will define you for the better. You know what I mean? You'll develop your skills. You'll develop your emotions. You live up with your Amuna, and, and that's what it's really all yeah, about. I was saying about this whole terrible thing that happened in Eretz Yisrael, you could listen to a hundred shirim on achdas and on loving your, your fellow, and something like this, it just changed all of us in an instant, going through something that was so horrible. And again, you could listen to so many classes, and you could, you could even write notes on it, but going through something is actually what develops you the best. Such a good point. Yeah, as we wrap up, I want to ask each of you if you have, if there's a story that inspires you from your experiences dealing with kalas, dealing with chassans, dealing with couples, whatever it is, is there a story that happened to you that you're like, um, wow. I, I have so many because I talk to so many girls, just giving them the chizak and the tools in order to navigate life and their, <laughs> their marriages. Um, but what really inspires me is the people that actually hear and actually do it. It is so hard. You could hear it and it could sound nice. <laughs> you could hear it thousand year and it could sound nice. But when it actually comes into practical and you have to use that three minutes to peek the other person's perspective and say it, it is very, very hard work. So for anyone that actually does that, it is a call up vote to them that they do that and that they have the self-awareness to be able to put in all the the work and they, they're able to put up with things and see the benefits and stuff that's going on. I, I would stand. I stand up for these girls, especially when it was extremely difficult. So, uh, hundreds Bar Hashem of stories of people who they did this perspective shift, and they're doing great. Yeah, I, I want to say that. To me, I think that we are all like enamored by success, and to a large degree, success in any area really is people who they broke barriers or they became comfortable with being uncomfortable, and they were able to get to certain places. So, to me. There's one girl that comes to mind that I, I, I think about a lot. You know, this girl went through extreme abuse. She came to talk about it. Um, and what I find is that people who struggle, who have been, I'll call it, they have been, you know, abused in various ways. They have a hard time with Shabbos. Shabbos oftentimes goes out the window. Tzniyas also, right? The idea of dressing modestly because they could sometimes feel like it's very restrictive. Mm. But specifically when it comes to this, and, you know, I used to work with Rabbi Zachary Wallerstein before he passed away. Um, and it opened me up to a whole world of dealing with, with single girls. And this girl came in, she was struggling with Shabbos. She said, I, I can't be alone with my own thoughts, with my own, you know, just sitting there by myself. It's too much for me. So she's, she's distracted the whole Shabbos. She watches things on her phone and things like that. And we had a long conversation about it. And at one point I said, you know, maybe you want to tackle this. She's going through therapy and she's going through a lot, but. She said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Like, I'll try to live with myself, which is, I don't think we think about Shabbos like that, but it's like the ability to have less distraction, I'm not working. I'm not, you know, dialed out into other things in the world. 
Um, and then every Shabbos, she would text me, you know, at whatever time she broke Shabbos. And I asked her, I said, please don't text me that because it, it kills me. But after Shabbos, text me, you know, how long you made it. And then one Shabbos, she sent me a text. It was like almost to the Zman of Havdalah. <laughs> I think if you're Litvish enough, it could, it could even be considered like Havdalah Zman. You know, and she said, like, I made it till now, which was almost like an entire 25 hours. And, and that blew me away. Like this is a person who really has a struggle. And in their, in their life, I consider that a tremendous amount of success, a certain amount of gvura. So, you know, I'll say like my wife is naturally very positive in life. It's not as hard for her. I know that there's parts that are not like that, but my wife, my life has, you know, what I'm saying that because it's always that balance, but like I have the, the rigid side of things. My wife has the positive side of things. And I think that for certain people, certain things are natural. Right. You have certain natural talents. I have certain natural talents. My life does. And they're all totally different from each other. When it comes to like somebody else changing their, their nature, I think that's one of the hardest things for a person to do. And when somebody has a specific struggle and they're able to break through that struggle, to me, that's always like, wow, Kalakavo, like my hat is off to you because you were able to like do something that I don't know if I'd be able to do that. I don't know if in my own struggle, if I'd be able to like say, I'm going to push through, I'm going to live in this moment, right? How often are we upset? And we, it's so easy to tell somebody else to calm down, <laughs> right? When you're upset about something, then you justify in your mind why it's okay to be upset right now. But when somebody's able to like, I'll call it be misgabber, when they're able to like work on that inner strength to like step up to the plate and say, no, I'm working on this and I'm able to really tackle this. I think it's one of the hardest things. So when I see people who do that, who change their marriage, like my wife is saying, like they listen to an idea and they make it practical or they change the way that they were, you know, they were working in their marriage. I think to me, that's one of the the most amazing things. And I just want to say, I, I just recently said this um, idea, it like struck me that I was once sitting next to somebody on a panel and somebody asked, they said, what if my wife wants something and, and I can't give it to them, right? The example you gave before, like, you know, as a husband, he's rough around the edges or something like that, right? And the wife wants a calmer husband. She wants something that's better for her, or gives her more. So the panelist who was sitting next to me said, um, you know, if let's say if, if you're if you're an apple and your wife is an orange and she wants orange juice, then what are you going to do? You're going to give her apple juice because you're an apple. And when it came to my turn, I said, well, you better figure out how to get her some orange juice because, right, if that's what your spouse is, if that's their essence, like a woman naturally needs a husband who talks calmer to her and who's able to like relate to her emotional needs. And yes, there are benefits to the man being who he is and he's making a lot of money. When he comes home, he he better learn to switch to a different mode. And the guy who's very sweet and kind to his wife, it's great. He also needs to develop himself to the point that he can earn a living for his family and get out into the business world and handle those challenges as well. So life is about a long-term development course. And I think that marriage is probably the the best the best catalyst for a person developing themselves along that course. You're given a person, I don't want to call it a creature, but an, an individual that is very different than you, very similar, homo sapien, in the same general category, but very different than you. And that person's going to push your buttons on an inner side of things. They're not just going to externally, how did you think that? How did you feel that? They're going to push your buttons. And if a person goes along with saying, this is for the best, I'm going to allow this process to play itself out. It will change me as a person. I think that's one of the most incredible things. When a person can take those words and like go along with it, that's transformative. My hat is off to anybody who's able to make that happen. As you're saying this, I'm actually thinking of a story of somebody who had a hard time with keeping a certain aspect of halacha. Um, and it was, it was due to certain anxieties that she had and it was very difficult for her. Um, and she would tell me, you know, this time it wasn't so great. This time wasn't so great. This time wasn't so great. And one month she texted me. She said, I just want you to know I'm on the way to the mikvah. And this month we kept everything 100%, even though it was very, very difficult. Um, and I mean, that's how it's supposed to be. Right. But because it was a girl who was struggling so much with this, I, was very emotional that she did this and she was able to do this. And I made her give me a bracha. I said, send me, it was a voice note. I said, please send me a voice note because I want to replay it for myself. But I need a bracha coming from somebody who it was so difficult and she was able to do it. Give me a bracha. And she gave me the most beautiful bracha. And um, And you're going to play it now. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah. So people who work on themselves, just like you're saying, you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. That's so nice. Okay. Before... We finally end. What is, where's the place where we could find 
everything you're doing. I mean, you're both doing so much, but like this is the plug time. Yeah, plug I away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think directing people to two things. One is Torah Anytime, which I have to give a huge shout out to Torah Anytime because they approached me, I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe like eight, nine years ago to start giving classes. And at the time, honestly, I never, I, I didn't realize the scope of Torah Anytime. So definitely TorahAnytime.com. There's a lot of content over there. And I have a site called MarriagePro.co. And I want to just give a, a small plug, if I could, to anyone who wants to get more involved in family purity. We have a complete guidebook to family purity. Probably one of the most clear. It is so. It is so clear. Can you just show them how you set it okay, up? Okay, fine. It's brilliant. Yeah. This is my I, I want you to this produce. This is my husband's brain. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, it's, there's no shame on Sparrow and Jewish books, but like, it's like perfect, like textbook kind of style, like anything you need to find, like. Very user friendly. It's so good. Thank you. So it, this is literally my brain. <laughs> I don't know how many years this took to, to come out. It was like a tremendous amount of time, but basically, I uh, show this to the camera. So it's a beginner, intermediate, and advanced book all in one. And then it's broken up into four categories, one, two, three, four. So you can easily find when you open the book on the side, exactly where you're holding. It's like a, a sidebar. So you flip it open, you know exactly where you're holding in the book. Um, and this is on family purity. And then when I did this, I had two amazing designers, um, Yocheved Herzog and Rachelea Black. And basically I told them, I don't want you to just design this book. I plan on coming out with other books. So they design the covers because people do judge a book by the cover. So they design the covers of these other books as well. One on dating, one on marriage and one on parenting. And now as we stand, I have like the first, it's not the final copy, but the final copy is actually at the printer of dating for marriage. So this is going to be in bookstores and online on Amazon in the next couple of days. Or I love how like you made the covers for the books like all of them yeah. before yeah. it's even finished yeah. you're like i'm gonna do this yeah, i'm gonna do this because it's also for me like now i have to write the book yeah. you know it's and, like this, printed and, and this book also it's not in color yet but it will be printed in full color has like the sidebar so it takes you through like the research stage all the way through like after the date so it's everything that you need to know about dating and then the next one will be on marriage which we're going to get started on in the next couple of days so this one has to roll out and then we're going to transition to that one so yeah for me i like to like I have to do this now. Everyone's like, where's the book? I'm like, uh, you know, I have to at least be working on it. So it's on the bus. It's on the bus. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's on the bus. It just hasn't arrived yet. So yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for opening your home. Yes. I also just want to say, yeah, sure. Um, Mazel tov to you on like a million thank subscribers. You. Thank you. Yeah. It's nuts. It's, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah. Me and you, we've spoken before. We've yeah. handled like Mr. Beast and yeah. YouTube. It's, it's, it's surreal. It's crazy. Well, yeah. It's really surreal. Well, it's, it's, it's well deserved. Well deserved. Very well deserved. Thanks so much. It's great content and you're helping a lot, a lot of people. So. Kudos to you for Ask everything. Ask the right questions Thank in you. a very relaxed manner. And it's great. great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. And if you listened or watched this episode because you're like, hey, I really like these stuff. Thank you. And if you're doing it because you feel bad for me, I thank you even more. Uh, if you got this far in this week's YouTube video or Spotify, go ahead and leave the code word love, L-O-V-E. I look at every single one of your comments and I like them, I heart them, I respond to them, and it means a lot to me. And if you have not yet gone to pick purple go to their website and find the link in the show notes and just get rid of the clothes that you don't need that's the the, the most important thing of like you have it in your closet get rid of it already but of course it's going to help the girls at batya and it's going to help the people that are in need of good clothing for them maybe it's not good clothing for you anymore but it's still good for them and if you have not yet reached out to our friends at bitbean i cannot tell you enough of course their actual product and services that they offer is the best but i think most importantly they are a pleasure to deal with whenever you bring in any others to help your business or company or organization you want to deal with good people if you haven't yet gotten anything from twillery their pants their suits their shirts their polos their scarves their coats go ahead and go to twillery.com i am personally urging you to get their ear suit because come springtime they're not even going to have them in stock because it's winter when they launched and it was out of stock right away so go ahead check out their ear suit you'll get 18 dollars off with the code word inspire and if you are in need of someone that could help your business in ways that you're like 
I, 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 I can't hire a full-time secretary because the, going into the finance, boom, hiring for less, $7 an hour. Whether you need a, a video editor, I get the question so often, I need a video editor, who do you recommend? I recommend you call hiring for less or uh, you know, someone to work, help you with your graphics, whatever it is, go check out hiring for less. Give them a call because they are gonna walk you through it and also they're gonna help set you up with the right employee for you. So go ahead and check them out. If you enjoyed this episode because you're single and you're like, hey, I wanna know more about marriage and how to have a great marriage. Boom, share this with your friends who you think would be great. If you're in a happy marriage, great. Now you're gonna have an even happier marriage. If you're in a marriage that like many marriages takes work and I think all of them, takes hard work to make it awesome, go ahead and share this maybe with your spouse or yeah, share with your spouse and share with your mother-in-law if you want. I don't know, or your father-in-law or your father or your mother. And uh, just realize that there's inspiration everywhere. And we have a lot of very powerful episodes coming up. And I also need to say before we finish that a big thank you to Rabbi Ruvain and Getty. The first time this ever happened to me, we recorded a whole entire episode back in July, I think, or August. And I messed up. I lost one of the chips and we have 90% of the interview, but there was a video angle shot that we're missing. Um, it's funny, I have the whole audio experience. Maybe we'll release that another time. Um, but they were so kind and really did not make me feel bad for literally ruining the interview. So we went ahead and recorded this many months later, kind of like a new conversation. And I think I think this conversation was the better one. I, I enjoyed that conversation also, but kudos to them. They're, they're such nice people. I uh, totally would have understood if they would have been upset, but they, if they were upset, they didn't even show any signs of it. So kudos to them. Maybe leave a comment in the YouTube video saying how nice they are because they are great. And of course, most importantly, go ahead and check out Reb Ruvain's book. Actually, after the first time I interviewed him, he gave me the first book he came out with, The Complete Guidebook to Family Purity. It is so... I've never seen such an organized book because the topic is overwhelming, but he does it in such a easy to consume way and it's it's great. So definitely go check that out. And I, I'm in the middle of their new book, The Complete Guide Book to Dating for Marriage. You could go ahead and buy them at feldime.com or the link in the show notes. Go ahead, check out those books. They're awesome books, Svarim, I don't even know what to say. And right before you sign off, we got two very important announcements to make. One is we are finishing the entire Torah, Gemara, Tanakh, Mishnais, Tehillim during the Super Bowl. You can go to onecm.com to join, to take your daf, to take your parak, to take whatever it is in Torah that you'll hold on to. While the whole world is looking at the Super Bowl, we're going to unite together to daven and to learn in schus for the return of the hostages right now and for the safety of our soldiers. We're all doing this. Does it make a difference? How Jewish or un-Jewish you feel, if you're a Jew, we want you getting involved in learning Torah with us. And as well, we are doing something every Sunday at 9 p.m., doing something live on unitedwedaven.org. You can go ahead and join to say to Hillam along with us every week. We're going to have a special guest, a special rabbi, a mother of a hostage, whoever it is, someone who's going to help you say to Hillam with more oomph. And go to unitedwedaven.org. You could join. We have a WhatsApp group. It's actually blew up pretty quickly. So go ahead and join the movement today. Remember, inspire. I almost forgot that. Inspiration is everywhere. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.